Indian cricket. Hello and welcome to another episode of World Cup Rewind. On this edition, we're going to be looking at the World Cup that happened in 1996. Now remember, this was the sixth edition of the tournament. Also, we're going to see fifth time winners. That will be Sri Lanka. What is that one other thing that has been common that we saw from the last few World Cups? That is underdogs have been winning. Starting with India in 83, followed it up with Australia in 87. Similar story in 92 with Pakistan. You are going to have a new winner. Another subcontinental team in Sri Lanka in 1996. This was also a World Cup of many first. We will talk about that in detail. I'm Nikhil Nas and with me as always Rajdeep Sardesai. But as is with most World Cups, there's going to be a controversy too. Before I dwell into our first talking point, which is the controversy that happens in the back room, behind the scenes, what are your memories or the first thing that comes to your mind when I say the 1996 World Cup? You know, the first thing that comes to my mind, Nikhil, was that it was the first World Cup in a way when private news television had exploded in India. Hmm. In 87, you just had Doordarshan. By the time 96 comes, uh, you're really entering the age of private news TV. A couple of channels are experimenting with 24-hour news TV. Uh, the Doordarshan monopoly is broken. Everyone is scrambling to somehow get a slice of that World Cup pie. I still remember, you know, trying to negotiate in a way uh, with the broadcasters. How can we, as private news channels, get a slice of this World Cup. Can we interview all the captains? Can we do a show? Suddenly, we were talking about private news TV uh, getting a share of the World Cup pie. So that's the first thing uh, that strikes out to me. Because remember, and I'm sure we'll speak about him, Mark Mascarenas, yes. the World Tell Chairman, uh, the man who transformed, in a way, the way, in a way, the way television uh, could, uh, could raise revenues. Uh, for yeah. cricketers and for Indian cricket. Okay, but the controversy, the two stalwarts, and because Rajdeep talks about that TV deal, this was the very first time that Doordarshan agreed to pay to broadcast live cricket matches. Remember before that, Doordarshan was very reluctant. They take Doordarshan to court, that is uh, Jagmohan Dalmia and I.S. Bindra, two stalwarts of Indian cricket administration, and win that court case in 1993. After which, Doordarshan is now forced to pay for the World Cup. So at this point, they have combined forces. I.S. Bindra, Jagmohan Dalmia, they're like a team. They're the ones who set India on that financial roadmap when it comes to cricket. But when the 1996 World Cup starts, there are cracks in this friendship. It all starts with Pilcom, uh, that is headed, the secretary of that, that is the organizing committee, is Jagmohan Dalmia. Uh, he organizes uh, an opening ceremony at the Eden Gardens. There's a laser show there. A man from Italy, an artist from Italy is called upon. Uh, the media writes the next day that it was one of the worst opening ceremonies ever. And I.S. Bindra then, levels a very serious charge against Jagmohan Dalmia, goes to the CBI with tons of papers saying that there was a lot of corruption and Jagmohan Dalmia pocketed a lot of money. You know, when I look at the two of them, mm. I.S. Bindra and Jagmohan Dalmia, Jagmohan Dalmia was called Jaggu Dada by some. Yeah. And Jaggu Dada was a precursor to Lalit Modi. In a sense, he was someone who was trying to break the status quo, always looking for ways in which he could sort of take cricket uh, to the next level as a business. Mm. And, and so his eye was always on the main chance, based in Kolkata, and thereby the balance of power of Indian cricket was shifted from Mumbai to Kolkata in those years. And he would also later on, of course, conquer the ICC. So he was much more in-your-face uh, administrator, while IS Pindra was the more suave IS officer uh, from Punjab, uh, virtually dominated Punjab cricket administration. And interestingly, and few people know that, was also secretary to uh, Gyani Zel Singh, the mm. former president of India, in a rather controversial period when Rashtrapati Bhavan in the 1980s under Zel Singh was supposedly planning and plotting to remove Rajiv Gandhi mm -hmm. uh, from uh, prime ministership. So during that period, Jag uh, IS Bindra was very much a very influential power figure, political power figure. So he had the political connections. 
Jagmohan Dalmia had the business connections together. Mm. They made a great pair. Yes. But as you often know, you know, too too much friendship or too much proximity can lead to a divide, and that's exactly what happened. Right after that major controversy, the two went their separate ways. Jagmohan Dalmia's career was to soar as a cricket administrator. The year after that, 1996 World Cup, he would go on to become uh, the boss of the ICC, the first non-cricketer and the first man from Asia to hold that position. Of course, famously, they came back together after this, this fight that they had, this major controversy in 2005, where Jagmohan Dalmia then appointed IS Bindra in the marketing committee. But this is how this World Cup started with a controversy. Where we are right now is the famous Gaddafi Stadium in Lahore. This is where the final was played. The final was played between Sri Lanka and Australia. A fascinating tale if you see the build-up of this tournament and how these two teams reached the final. That's what we're going to tell you in our next segment. So let's head in inside the stadium. Okay, let's go inside the stadium. We are inside the Gaddafi Stadium in Lahore. Now remember, Pakistan are the defending champions at the time. Uh, the folks in Pakistan would be expecting to see their team play the final here. Many were betting on India to reach the final. That wasn't to be. The final was going to be played between Sri Lanka and Australia. But there's a long journey till we reach that final. And that journey starts from the initial group stages matches that were to happen in this World Cup. Or, I might add, some that didn't quite happen. All because of the political situation. Remember, this was a joint World Cup uh, that was organized between India, Pakistan and Sri Lanka. And Sri Lanka at that time was going through a political turmoil, which actually resulted in two teams, that's Australia and West Indies, not traveling there. What was happening at the time, Rajdeep? You know, the fact is the 1980s and the 1990s in particular, the 1990s in particular was Sri Lanka's decade of terrorism. Uh, the LTT was this larger-than-life terror force that had caused mayhem, uh, suicide bombings, of course, in a decade that started with the tragic assassination of former Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi in 1991. He was assassinated by the LTT and there was a series of incidents that would take place uh, as part of the civil war that was on in uh, Sri Lanka. And Sri Lanka getting the opportunity to co-host was a way of sending out a message to the world that, look, you know, we are slowly limping back to normal. But the world was not convinced. Uh, and particularly Australia uh, was the country that seemed to have the maximum problems in traveling to Sri Lanka. They seemed scarred by the violence. And once they said no, then it almost allowed other countries also to voice their reservations. These teams even dropped points. Mm. Teams actually drop points in the World Cup by saying we are not going to Sri Lanka, uh, we don't mind forfeiting our matches, but we want our player safety first. And India and Pakistan st stood by the Sri Lankans uh, in their hour of need in a way, uh, but I'm afraid the Western world was not willing to oblige. And the one thing that allowed some of these countries to really pull out was the change in format. Now remember, in our previous episode, we spoke about how the format of round robin, where each team plays against the other, the nine teams that participated, was considered the best format in the World Cup. So there was a lot of criticism when that format changed. There were 12 teams now, divided into two groups of six each. You had now included, for the very first time in a World Cup, associate nations. So you had a team uh, from Kenya, you had a team from UA, all of them included and that actually didn't go down too well with a few other participating countries also the journalists wrote against it what that allowed because the format was such you were going to have a quarter final so four teams were going to go from each group anyway and then you had two weaker teams that would be left by the wayside I'm just adding Zimbabwe apart from those three associate nations which allowed teams like Australia and West Indies to skip those games in uh, Sri Lanka knowing uh, fully well that they will qualify for that knockout that is the quarter final it wasn't the greatest format in that sense Nikhil because you had 12 teams and as you said eight of them qualified for the quarterfinals which meant effectively if you had three good days of cricket you could win the World Cup uh, because there was a clear division between the top eight teams and the seemingly bottom four. Uh, and I think it allowed the tournament to get elongated, which is what the television broadcasters perhaps wanted, a World Cup that went on for a month and uh, more. But it also meant that the real drama began with the quarterfinals. And there were some terrific quarterfinals and semifinals that were played in the World Cup, especially one game 
that no one will forget. Okay, we're going to talk about those quarterfinals. We're going to talk about the semifinal. But just to let you know what happened in the round robin stages, as Rajdeep points out, it was pretty easy for those teams to qualify for the quarterfinals. Few standout moments from those initial stages. One was the 188 that Gary Kirsten got against the UAE, which still today is the highest score in a World Cup game. He got that, and you could see the gulf between an associate team and then a cricketing powerhouse like South Africa. In that very same game, you had someone called Sultan Zarari who comes out to open without a helmet. Alan Donald, one of the fastest bowlers of the time, didn't quite enjoy that sight. So the first ball he bowls is a bouncer, hits him flush in the head, and promptly he then goes on to get that helmet. So certain standout moments that you saw in the round robin stages, but as Rajdeep talks about the quarterfinals, the semi-finals and then the finals. Because Australia had pulled out, it didn't go down too well with the Sri Lankan team. They had a bit of a, a history as well, Australia and Sri Lanka. Arjuna Rana Tunga famously said at the time when Australia pulled out that, you know what, we want to reach the final, we want Australia to reach the final, and we want to beat this Australian team in the final. Prophetic words, you would say, at that time. We'll get to those games in our next segment. We're going to focus on India's campaign at the 1996 World Cup now. Winners in 83 uh, reached the semi-finals in 87, didn't quite reach the knockout stage in uh, 1992. This was a World Cup at home. Much was expected out of the Indian team. As you all know already, the campaign finished in the semi-final. But before I get to the semi-final, I want to start with their league stages. One game that I remember was against Australia. They lost to Australia and that trend of India losing to Australia in the World Cup that we had seen in the previous uh, two occasions continued here as well. However, there's another game that is played in Delhi at the Feroz Shah Kotla. Rajdeep was there at the ground, which was very significant in letting us know what was about to unfold as the tournament progressed. It was one of the most significant World Cup matches in more ways than one, uh, Nikhil, because, uh, you know, we are talking nowadays about baseball. Uh, you know, this trend to play aggressive cricket in test cricket, almost take the one-day format into the five-day cricket format. In those days, one-day cricket, the first 15 overs, were played with relative serenity. You played traditional cricket. The Sri Lankans come in with Sanat Jayasurya and Ramesh Kalu Vitarna, and the two of them just change the rules of the game. They go bang, bang, bang above the head from the very first ball. To some extent, the New Zealanders had done it in 1992, but these two take it to another level. And that match at the Firosha Kotla, which I watched, you know, you were astounded. The Sri Lankans were pounding away at the Indian attack. And I think you realize that some of the Indian cricketers in that World Cup were past their sell by date. Manoj Prabhakar, for one, someone who was an outstanding one day cricketer, but was reaching the end of his career. And by the end of that game, he had started bowling off spin. Yeah. Because you had Jai Surya left handed, Romesh Kaluvirthana right handed, perfect left hand, right hand combination. And they made life very difficult, not just for the Indian attack in that team, but all attacks over the World Cup. They were really the secret sauce to the New Zealand recipe, for, uh, for, to the Sri Lankan recipe for success in that World Cup. As Rajdeep points out, uh, this was something that you were seeing for the very first time in ODI cricket. Yes, we did speak about uh, the New Zealand openers doing it in the last World Cup, but this was revolutionary because they would continue attacking uh, till the time they were on the crease. Manoj Prabhakar, Rajdeep speaks about, bowled four overs, gave away 47 runs. In fact, the first two overs he bowls in his regular medium pace. The next two overs, he's actually reduced to an off-spinner. Bowls off-spin. Interestingly, that was the last time that he ever played for India. Doesn't get a game after that. And soon enough after that, I think the tour for England, the team has announced he's not picked and he announces his retirement. So that was the last time you saw Manoj Prabhakar bowl, all courtesy because of Sanat Jaisuriya Kaluvedana. Sanat Jaisuriya gets 79 odd uh, quick fire, a strike rate of over 100. It's close to 200 strike rate for Ramesh Kaluvedana, who gets 26 of, I think, 15 or 16 deliveries at that time. Interestingly, that concept before they even started that this experiment uh, was done by Dave Watmore, the coach of the Sri Lankan team, and the captain Arjuna Ranatunga. And famously, Ranatunga narrates this tale that Jay Surya, who had never opened before that, and Ranatunga and Dave Watmore asked him, listen, you open and set the stage on fire. And uh, Jay Surya goes like, but I've never opened. What if I fail? You'll never 
let me play for Sri Lanka again. Rana Tunga tells him, don't worry. This is an experiment that I'm doing. If you do not succeed, I'm going to protect you. I'll send you back to the middle order, but you must try this and rest as they say is history. So that game in effect tells you what Sri Lanka can do, how dangerous they are in this tournament. But from there on, India qualify for the quarterfinal. Now this is the big ticket game. India versus Pakistan in Bangalore. You know, India versus Pakistan anywhere is always a, a, a great cricket game to watch. But the first India-Pakistan World Cup game in India mm. is 1996. And that's what makes it extra significant. Uh, the Pakistanis were relying on their fast bowlers. Yeah. They had the wakar wasi Akram combination. Uh, and that's what they were hoping for would take them uh, through to the World Cup final. And then they get some bad news on the eve of the match, uh, which many believe later on, you know, led to all kinds of wild speculation. Wasim Akram, yes. the great Wasim Akram is injured. Yeah, pulls out because of a side strain. That's right. So suddenly the odds, you know, because India had a strong batting lineup. Mm -hmm. So you had Sachin Tendulkar, yeah. who was slowly approaching, you know, greatness. This was Sachin Tendulkar at the age of 26. He just hit Magra. I remember that match against Australia yes. for I think four or five fours uh, in, in his first over. And they were incredible shots. You know, Magra was also uh, just about emerging as a, as a talent in the game. And he faces this young Sachin Tendulkar at the Wankhede Stadium. And you think Sachin by then can walk on water. He can do anything. He's the darling of the Indian crowds. He's now taking on the Pakistanis. There was also a certain Navjot Singh Sidhu yes. opening the Indian batting. And this was uh, Sixar Sidhu of 87 in a new avatar, much more controlled aggression, but a damn good player to have in your side. You had Mohammad Azaruddin, you had Sanjay Manzrekar, you had a young Vinod Kambli. Uh, the Indian batting was its strength and led and managed by a very canny manager in Ajit Wadekar. You know, Ajit Wadekar is one of those most understated uh, men of Indian cricket. I call him the Amol Palekar of Indian <laughs> cricket. Canny, but understated. Uh, you never saw him uh, speak out too much, not the greatest vocabulary, but knew the game, understood the game. So he with his sort of uh, providing you the backroom skills and all these, this talent in front of you, India were for once favourites in that game against Pakistan, I would say. That's right. It is a batting paradise. Everyone knows the Chinnaswamy Stadium uh, in Bangalore. And that's what happens. India pile on 287, which in those days was a massive, massive total. Uh, Rajdeep speaks about uh, Navjot Singh Sidhu. He gets you 93 runs. India have got 287. But I think uh, the one who stole the limelight was Ajay Jadeja with his 45 of just 25 deliveries. In those days, you never saw that kind of counter attacking knocks and that over versus Vakar Yunus is reverse swinging the ball. Uh, it's an old ball, very tough to hit, but Ajay Jadeja manages to do that. There is one particular shot Ajay Jadeja plays in, in an innings and he dines out on it. You know, much like Kirti Azad <laughs> dines out of the 83 Sursura that gets Ian Botham out in the semi-final. Ajay Jadeja often uh, talks about the six that he hit of uh, Vakar Yunus uh, between mid -weekend and mid on I mean, this was Vakar Yunus uh, arguably one of the greatest uh, one-day bowlers you've ever seen, deadly Yorker. But Ajay Jadeja was a very skillful one-day cricketer. Makes room for himself, gives him uh, gives himself that space, much like what today's T20 batsmen do. In those days, T20 wasn't there. So it was all very unusual when players attempted the kind of strokes that Ajay did. Very audacious. And I think that innings, uh, Nikhil, was really the turning point of that match. Those runs that he scored, that 20, uh, that 20 odd in the last few over, last couple of overs, yeah. suddenly gave India a score that looked potentially match winning. Okay, 287 as I mentioned uh, and Pakistan have to now chase it down in 49 overs uh, because of the over rate that one over was cut off. In 49 overs it becomes a tougher task but the way the Pakistani openers give them the start in Amir Sohail, Saeed Anwar, they are 84 without losing a wicket in 10 overs. So they're way ahead of the required run rate. It seems like that this will be an easy chase. I mentioned how it's very easy to get a lot of runs in Bangalore. And then there is that moment that we speak of till today. It is Amir Sohail, it is Venkatesh Prasad. Rajdeep, what happens? Amir Sohail versus Venkatesh Prasad. You can't get two more contrasting <laughs> figures on a cricket field. Venkatesh Prasad, like the Bangalore air, very calm, 
uh, a really good fast bowler, but not your typical in your face aggressive fast bowler. Uh, Amir Sohel, on the other hand, uh, very mercurial uh, Punjabi, uh, always uh, out for a joust, ready to take you on. Also took on some of his own players in his own <laughs> team over the years. Uh, you know, got into all kinds of pangas or fights, as they say, even within Pakistani cricket. He's striking the ball terrifically, uh, hits a couple of terrific shots, uh, steps out and hits one through point uh, uh, to Venkatesh Prasad. And uh, Prasad looks at him and Amir Sohel points to where he's hit the ball. So here you have a classic India-Pakistan confrontation that's been played again and again. And I remember asking Venkatesh Prasad, uh, you know, what was, what was your reaction to Amir Sohil doing that? He said, you know, in his typical gentle way, I was really angry. <laughs> you know, and when Venkatesh Prasad says I was really angry, uh, he was raging within. But the next ball, he gets him bold. Yep. Uh, because Amir Sohel has just lost control, believes he can hit every ball for four, plays a terrible shot, gets him bold and look what Venkatesh Prasad does you know, shows him the, uh, the way to the dressing room. And I think that exchange between, in, uh, between Sohail and Venkatesh Prasad will go down as one of the classic encounters of India-Pakistan cricket and just why uh, we are so looking forward to another India-Pakistan clash in this World Cup. Right. Uh, what happened at the time, as Rajdeep uh, points out, you know, Amir Sohail telling him that put a fielder there, I'm going to hit you for another four there. Points it out to Amir Sohail. Uh, at that time, Amir Sohail is telling uh, Venkatesh Prasad. Venkatesh Prasad, even though he got angry, was smart enough then to bowl a ball that actually comes in. Amir Sohail is hell-bent on hitting the ball at the exact same spot where he had mentioned he will. It wasn't to be. The ball comes in. He's bowled. Rest, uh, as you say, is history. Those images have been replayed and played and many times over on our television screens. Every time there's an India-Pakistan game, we get to see that. From there on, India win that game and there's celebration everywhere. Yeah, Rajdi. Just one point about that game, that the other, uh, the other memory of it is it was uh, Javed, the last time we saw the great Javed yes. Miandad, certainly on an Indian ground, and he got run out. And the last thing you would have thought is Javed, who was a terrific runner between the wickets, not so much for his partner, but certainly for himself, uh, <laughs> gets himself run out. He's got back problems. He's struggling to get the ball off the square. Uh, and Imran Khan in the commentary box says something like, Javed Miandaz has run himself out into history, almost suggesting that was the end of Javed Miandaz. So for me, who had you know, always been fascinated by Javed Miandaz's batting, it was a bittersweet moment uh, to to think that Javed Miandad, after whom I, I think I told you on a previous show, a Hindi picture had a villain called Javed, Javed Miandad. That's so that was the kind of image that Javed Miandad had among Indian cricket fans. While he was on the crease in Bengaluru, we almost thought, who knows, Pakistan might do a Sharjah yet again. Okay, so this, in fact, as uh, Rajdeep says, bittersweet. It was definitely sweet for the Indian team. I hear stories from the player of that generation in Venkatesh Prasad, Ajay Jadeja, all of them telling us that they couldn't actually reached their hotel that night. There was traffic jam, the bus just couldn't move and it took them hours before they could reach uh, their team hotel. And this is much before the infamous Bangalore traffic that you encountered today. Talking about bitter, uh, we spoke about Vasim Akram pulling out. His house was stoned in Lahore. That was the repercussions or the reactions that happened in Pakistan. They were knocked out of that World Cup. From there on, uh, it wasn't going to be great news for India when they go to the semi-final. Once again, uh, they are up against a team which had beaten them in the group stage. But you thought this Indian team is going to win against Sri Lanka. You're playing at the Eden Gardens. And we talk about their dangerous two opening batsmen in Sanat Jaisuriya. Kalu Vidharna, you think that's their trump card. Javagal Srinath comes in that first over, gets both of them out. They're out, and at that time, India is celebrating. Little do they know what's about to. You know, I, I remember watching the, the beginning of the match. For some reason, you remember these moments, even though it's, what, 27 years ago. I was having butter chicken at Pandara Road. Don't ask <laughs> me why I was having butter chicken at Pandara Road, because I remember there was a TV screen that had been put up in the middle of the market. And when the second wicket falls, you know, we think it's game, set and match. These are the same two batsmen who clobbered us here at the Kotla. Now they're out in the first couple of overs. Uh, but we hadn't reckoned with the brilliance of someone called Arvinda De Silva, who in many ways um, even outshone the great Sachin Tendulkar on that particular day. Because I have seen a lot of sublime innings 
in, in big games, but probably none better than that in terms of just, uh, he was the silent assassin. You know, Arvinda De Silva could be a remarkable player, particularly of the back foot, the square cut and the pull, few have played it better. And that half century that he scored turned the momentum of that, of that semi-final. He would go on to score 100 in the final, but I think that semi-final knock was, yes. if anything, even better. Okay, 66 is what Arvinda De Silva gets, takes Sri Lanka to a respectable, I might say, at 251, but you don't put it past India to chase that total down, especially with Sachin Tendulkar in tremendous form. 98, they are for one, Sachin Tendulkar on the crease, about the 24th, 25th over, you think India have got it under control. That one delivery, unfortunate, hits his leg, Sachin's, and then drags onto the stump, he's out. From there, the game completely changes. What happens, Nikhil, is I think the wicket was, had begun to turn, mm. uh, which is rather unusual for a 50-over game that it'll start sort of almost a couple of balls start turning square. And uh, uh, the Sri Lankans had a good spin attack. Dharmasena, who's now an umpire, uh, was there in the, in the Sri Lankan team. The great Muthaya Murlitharan, they really had the bases covered when it came to spin. So batting second, mm. With a wicket beginning to turn, once Sachin is out, then Sanjay Manzrekar follows soon uh, after. The Indian team just uh, just isn't able to handle the pressure. You know, the pre the one thing about playing at the Eden Gardens, and there's going to be a semi-final in this World Cup. There, yes. it's a great place to play cricket uh, in terms of you know 70, 80 thousand people screaming for an Indian victory, but it also puts a lot of pressure. And I think the Indians couldn't handle the pressure that day against Sri Lanka, who simply realized this was their great moment in the sun. Okay, 98 for one India, and then they succumb to 120 for eight. Those visuals that we talk about, the pitch turning square, and, and I think the one other thing that Sri Lanka had at that time were these all-rounders in Aravinda De Silva, Sanat Jaisuria, who could more than roll their arm overs. They proved to be very dangerous. Uh, the match is called off. Uh, Clive Lloyd is the match referee. After an incident, of course, the crowd's going wild. You could see a bit of, you know, uh, fire in the stands. But I think that one moment where a bottle or something is thrown onto a player, Arjuna Ranatunga goes and complains. Clive Lloyd comes down to the ground, monitors the situation, and then awards that game to, uh, to the Sri Lankan team, which is also something that didn't go down well with the Kolkata crowd. That's right. Two images stand out from the end. One is of a disconsolate Vinod Kambli sobbing. You know, he's there at the crease when, you know, the game is almost abandoned, uh, when the game is abandoned and, you know, he's crying because he seemed to believe, he tells me, that he would have <laughs> taken India to victory. It was not going to happen. Yes. But, you know, Vinod, Vinod has a way of, uh, you know, he's always been a very positive soul and uh, for him also it was a big stage and he believed he could perform on the big stage. For It was an in, end of an era in a way. Vinod Kamli really never took his cricket career then to the next level. Sanjay Manzrekar also never was able to post that, really, you know, keep his career going. Azaruddin would then go on to slightly tougher days uh, off the field as well. Uh, Ajit Wadekar's uh, reign as manager, coach was coming to an end. And there was a controversy. Why did India, this was asked post facto, not when those first two wickets fell in the, in the first over, why did India win the toss and put the Sri Lankans into bat if they knew that the wicket would turn? And when the match-fixing controversy erupts a few years later, many fingers were pointed at this game suggesting that Mohammad Azaruddin took that decision under match-fixing pressures. I spoke to a lot of the team members, including Sanjay Manzrekar, who is a dear friend, and he maintained that in the team meeting, there was a consensus that we should bat second because Sri Lanka are good chasers, which I think was a very negative way to look at a match. You shouldn't look at the strengths of your opponents, look at your own strengths. But India won the toss and by consensus chose to field first. Well, that's right. In fact, uh, on the eve of the meeting, and I spoke to a few players as well, you're right. Everyone agreed that you should be chasing and India decided to do that. However, there was only one man who never spoke in previous team meetings, it was the only time that he spoke in that meeting, it was the only one who said, no, I think it's a pressure game, it's a knockout game, we must bat first. His name was Navjot Singh Sidhu, but he was outnumbered because everyone else thought we must chase. 
and in hindsight you could say that Sidhu was right. Sixer Sidhu was bang on. Uh, that was how India's campaign ended. Another disappointment for India, but it wasn't to be for Sri Lanka. They, of course, reached the final. Waiting there was going to be an Australian team. They found it tough to reach the final as well. That story coming up. We're going to turn our attention to the final. Sri Lanka versus Australia. But before that, a quick take on the semi-final. And it wasn't easy for the Australian team to reach that uh, final. This semi-final was played at the newly built stadium in Mohali. And it is a situation where Australia find themselves in 15 for four. Kirtley Ambrose wrecking havoc at that time. Then there's a 138 run partnership between Stuart Law and Michael Bevan. Takes Australia to 207, which you would say even uh, you know, by the standards of 1990s, it was below par. Even then, West Indies is cruising. They're just about 50-odd runs short of the target. They still have eight wickets in hand. And then they commit Harakiri. They lose about eight wickets, just getting about 37 runs in those last 50 deliveries. And Australia go on to win that semi-final against all odds, you might add. Then they reach the final. It's at the Gaddafi Stadium. I'd mentioned at the start of the program, Ranatunga had said that I want Australia to come and play in the final. Just to give you a bit of a context, there's a lot of history. Just before that, Sri Lanka has toured Australia. Uh, there are ball tampering charges in the Perth Test match, which a Sri Lankan team take objection to. Those charges are later dropped. Then in the second Test match, it's that incident with Muthaya Murli Dharan, where umpire Daryl Hare calls him, I think, seven to eight times oh, for chucking. chucking. That's another incident where Arjuna Ranatunga at that time says, no, I'll take the team off. So there is a lot of friction. There is a lot of history between these two teams. One from that tour, the other from Australia, not traveling to Sri Lanka to play that game. And now they are against each other in the finals. You know, Nikhil, if we look at 1983 as India's great underdog story, one of the greatest underdog stories in sport, 1996 is Sri Lanka's moment in the sun. Because... Here is a country which has always lived in the shadow of India and Pakistan. These two big neighbors of the subcontinent. Here is a country that's gone through a very traumatic decade of violence because of terror and civil war. And the World Cup comes as their chance to showcase what Sri Lanka is all about. And it was a... I remember Tony Gregg, who was a great lover of Sri Lankan cricket, was part of the commentary team. And as we started off the show, you know, for World Tell, and Michael Mascarene, as private broadcasters doing the, uh, the World Cup coverage, they brought in some of this great talent, uh, the likes of Tony Gregg. And Gregg was an admirer of Sri Lankan cricket. He loved Sri Lanka. And he was rooting for Sri Lanka, not just because they were playing Australia, which he disliked, <laughs> but also because he was a great lover of Sri Lankan cricket. So it, you know, it all comes together in that final. They are, even in that match, the underdog. Australia has just... Uh, pulled a rabbit out of the hat against the West Indies and therefore go into the final with some confidence and momentum. I think the fact that it was a subcontinental pitch, mm. relatively slower, suited the Sri Lankan attack much more than the Australians. I think that made a big difference. And I think the Sri Lankans had an X factor in Arvinda De Silva. Uh, for just two innings to have been played in the semi-finals and finals, mm you'll find it very difficult to beat what Arvinda De Silva did. At a personal level, it was the first time I managed to get a Pakistan visa to go and watch a match in Pakistan. Oh. And it's a great place to watch cricket because the kebabs are flowing. <laughs> you know, a friend of mine uh, from Oxford was our host and he kept plying us with wonderful kebab. Uh, all he wanted in return or his mother wanted in return were copies of Stardust magazine. Yeah. This is 1990s. Pakistan... Uh, your hosts want copies of Stardust magazine. In return, they are willing to give you whatever you want. It was, uh, it was quite a final. Benazir Bhutto was seated, I remember, not too far away from us in the VVIP box. Uh, Pakistan was not there in the final. And I'll never forget a poster in that final. Madhuri de do, Kashmir le lo. <laughs> so, at the height of you know, militancy in Kashmir, you had one Pakistani fan... Madhuri Dixit was the big star of, uh, the, of Hindi cinema and the Pakistanis love their Bollywood cinema as much as they love their cricket. Mm. The one other man who was a big star 
uh, in cricket at the time. Arjuna Ranatunga was uh, really, you know, a wounded tiger at that time, as I mentioned the history that the two teams had. And then uh, Australia deciding not to go to Sri Lanka. Interestingly, before the final, couple of uh, stories that Ranatunga narrates himself. One, uh, this is by Ian Chappell, who's doing commentary. He's supposed to interview the two players. He narrates this, uh, this story where he's interviewing the two captains and Arjuna Ranatunga in that pre-match interview on purpose. Now, he was another one who could play mind games. That's he goes right. on to say that, uh, you know, he's asked about the War Brothers, saying that they're so good. Mark War is in the form of his life. He's got 300s already in that World Cup. He says, no, the War Brothers are good, but I think they're overrated. Uh, then he's asked about, uh, you know, Shane Warne as a spinner. He says, yeah, he's a good spinner, but I find him a bit mediocre as well. He's not that good. He says that in this interview. And then Ian Chappell tells us that when it is Shane Warne's turn to come for the interview, he's already heard what Arjuna Ranatunga has said. And Ian Chappell says that he, he, he mentions a line or two which you can't say on air. And Ian Chappell says, I know at that time, Arjuna Ranatunga has gotten inside their head. So this starts before the final. He was a master at that. The other story Ranatunga narrates, he says before the final, he said that five-star hotel, and I could see at breakfast table, you know, they, they were staying in the same hotel, the Australian team, you could see, I, I, you know, they were nervous, they were anxious, maybe even, you know, not talking much, maybe looking ahead to that final. And he said, I went down to the breakfast table to see where my teammates are. I couldn't find anybody. And then somebody tells me that there, there, there's, on the other side of the hotel. And he says, I go there, and typical five-star hotel in Pakistan, they have these carpet shops and so on and so forth there. And he says, my players are busy shopping because they know it's the last day in Pakistan. Somebody is buying carpet, somebody is buying shoes. So he knows that there's no pressure on my players. They're going relaxed into the final. And Ranatunga says that that's the moment I knew we're going to be winning this final. And that's how the game actually pans out. You know, you, you keep mentioning Ranatunga. There's a bit of Mahendra Singh Dhoni <laughs> in Arjuna Ranatunga. He was very calm, almost Buddha-like. Uh, uh, could get under your skin in one-on-one -on -one conversations, but otherwise never let on on the cricket field. You know, uh, he was not physically seen as a modern-day cricketer uh, mm. with his paunch and his sort of... Uh, rather slow movements on the field, but he was a very canny cricketer again. He knew his limitations, knew his strengths, and he knew his, the strengths and limitations, more importantly, of his team players. Knew how to get the best out of uh, each of them. And that's what this World Cup did. The Sri Lankan side, man-to-man, -man was no match for the Australians. Yeah. But their ability to handle pressure and uh, to, to really uh, seize the moment, uh, particularly, I, I, I repeat, Ar Arvinda De Silva scores 100 uh, in the final when they are chasing yeah. in a World Cup final. You're chasing 250 plus, not always easy. Uh, but he is the one player, both he and Ranatunga, who actually could take on Shane Warne very easily. You know, Ranatunga in particular versus Shane Warne, he had a great sort of shot over mid on. So the leg spinner coming into him. He would hit him over, uh, over the bowler's head or over mid-on. And Arvinda De Silva had a superb square cut yes. and a terrific pull. The two shots that you often need when you're playing the Australians because they will put most of the bowling short of length. On that wicket, Arvinda De Silva was, uh, was tough to, uh, to conquer. And the Australians, on the other hand, Mark Waugh, the star player of the World Cup, doesn't get runs in the final. Mark yeah. Taylor does. But Mark Taylor was a bit of an old-style opener when it came to one-day cricket. Ricky Ponting was just coming into his own, scores about 45 in the final. But they just don't get the kind of score you need on subcontinental wickets. I think if they've got 25, 30 more, yeah. they'd probably have done better. 241 is what Australia got. Uh, at one point, it looked like it was going to be a big total because once again, the two Sri Lankan openers did not fire. But as Rajdeep points out, it was once again Aravinda De Silva's day. He gets 107 not out. To give him company, first there's Gurusina at the beginning. He plays the support role and then comes in his captain in Arjuna Ranatunga. I'll always remember that shot. Even, you know, talking about how cool and calm he used to be, that winning stroke that he hits is just a double down to third man, gets a boundary. That's how Sri Lanka wins. But talking about tosses, this was another toss which was big, big, 
big controversy because before this, the five finals that had been played, the team that had batted first in a final had gone on to lift the cup. On this occasion, Arjuna Ranatunga wins the toss but says, no, we're going to chase. They chase, win that game. And I believe later he comes out and says that, you know what, he had paid a visit to the ground a day before and he knew there was going to be a lot of dew around which will make it very tough for the bowlers to be bowling. And he had plenty of spinners in his side. He didn't want them bowling with the dew. You know, we were neutrals watching the game. And for all of us, Sri Lanka winning the World Cup was a great story. Uh, you always want the underdog to win. Uh, it was a country going through uh, difficult times. Uh, so when Arjuna Ranatunga holds that World Cup trophy, I think the Indians in the crowd were celebrating. You know, Australia is someone you have a peculiar love-hate relationship with, with because you have wonderful cricketers whom you admire, but as a country playing against a subcontinental team, you'd usually pick the Sri Lankans. And uh, it, it, it was wonderful to have uh, yet another new World Cup champion. You know, you'd had four consecutive World Cups after the West Indies win the first two, which have had four different champions, India, Australia, Pakistan, and now Sri Lanka. Okay, we're going to wrap up this show and I'm going to quote something uh, that Rajdeep points to Tony Gregg, a big admirer of Sri Lankan cricket. He used to often say, and I can see them dancing in the aisles. He would refer to Kalu Vidana as Little Kalu. And you know, the Sri Lankan fans were indeed dancing in the aisles for years to come because this was the start of Sri Lankan cricket revolution. They would go on to dominate white ball cricket thereafter. That's uh, all that we could pack into this edition of our program, World Cup Rewind. We were looking back at the 1996 World Cup, a World Cup where Sri Lanka came as a breath of fresh air. We'll see you again for the next episode. Next up, it's going to be the other World Cup, which came after three years, unusual, in 1999.